he he did good for a long time because he he started out you know he did he was in skateboarding then he transitioned into snowboarding in the very very early days of snowboarding and as snowboarding progressed he progressed but then it got to a point to where he wasn't this full freestyle guy but you know because he was so good at riding the mountain, you know, he all of a sudden transitioned into this big mountain guy and was, you know, up in Alaska doing lines and stuff that nobody ever expected him to do. I mean, and he was he was amazing. You know, it was really cool to see that transition from just hardcore freestyle guy to like big mountain guy and to do both of them so well, you know, better than almost anybody, you know. I would definitely say he's like one of the first to bring freestyle to the to the backcountry to the big mountain, you know. When I first met Noah, he was definitely more focused on, you know, just freestyle and just riding squaw and just ripping the pipe. But he started kind of going up with my brother and I in the backcountry and just kind of dabbling around the steeps. He was a total natural talent. And then when we took him to Alaska, it, that's almost when his mind just, he just started, I think he just started just, just seeing the possibilities of riding up there. And I think that's just what unlocked, that was like the key that unlocked the door for Noah. He's just amazing to watch big mountain riding, and um, his uh, his ability on, on big mountain riding is, is 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 top ten for sure. Like he rode Tahoe all the time, so it was just like natural for him to like ride those type of conditions, and he did it sick, you know. Because it seemed like all the other guys that were just like big mountain riders kind of had like a weird style or just not as smooth, like I don't know, like Matt Goodwill or Tex or all those guys, you know. Like they were sick for sure, but then like. It was just cool to see somebody that could do it both. I remember he did like these one lines. I think they were called like super spines or something. He's like doing like front side airs like off them and it's like the steepest thing ever. Like if you fell, you'd just be dead probably from ragdolling. We did a season TB2 at Donner and that, that spring, let's go to Alaska. Okay, let's go. We just, that we, and we were just went up there and just started riding the stuff. It wasn't, we weren't really thinking about it really. And, that, and Noah wasn't thinking about it either. It wasn't like a goal. I want to charge super spines one day. I mean, I, I had to basically almost, almost talk him into that run when he finally did do that because it was just so ridiculously gnarly. But he was ready for it, and it was the perfect day to do it. Yeah, I would say, you know, anything that's spined out is usually the spines develop anything over 55 degrees. So you know you're on something steep if there's spines on it. And if it's powder and good conditions, I mean, there's nothing funner than that. It's really amazing feeling and the adrenaline you get from it is just unreal. Also being goofy foot in Valdez on the spines. I know this is a little bit of a sidebar that might be kind of a twist for people to understand, but a lot of the spines up there, if you're goofy foot, you're toe edging them and, and the way the, the, the sloughs run and the way the, the spines face, you're better off being a goofy foot on a lot of the lines up there. Not to stay on the big open faces like what Johan was charging and Tom Burt. I'm just talking steep technical spines that are close together. When you send a, a, a slough down a run, you'll have to hop to the next run and send your slough down. Goofy foot, Jeremy Jones, Noah Salaznik. Who rips the spines the hardest? Those two guys, you know, they're goofy foots. And I think Valdez and Haynes, maybe I'm crazy by saying that, but I don't know. Ask Jeremy or Noah what they think, but that's, that's my opinion. A lot of them, the spine runs, I would, you know, assess the line and I like to be able to ride from, from left to right because you deal with these slough slides up there, they're called, and they're basically mini avalanches and they're made from your turns. Being on a steep snow, s slope, throwing all that snow from your turns creates these little avalanches. And uh, when I saw like super spines, for instance, it was kind of a big face, but I was able to go diagonal knowing all my snow would go below me and I wouldn't encounter it again. So I didn't have to deal with the slough, and you can also jump from one to the other, and I've always kind of prided myself on bunny and from one spine to the next and kind of staying on the powder line and out of the channels, and maybe that's what Mike's talking about, appreciates my technique on the spines, because that's kind of my approach, I guess, a little bit. A lot of times, you know, we'll have to take a Polaroid from the helicopter on the way up, because we haven't been to this mountain before or flown by it, so you get on top and you can't see over the edge, really. Even if you walk down close to the edge, it keeps rolling over, so you really rely on these Polaroids that you take on the way up to, to know where you're at and to, to find your line down, and uh, it's really essential in Alaska, especially. That could be a go. That could be we're sick. Starting here and then we're going to add on to this. So, with, so you, all your stuff draining. The first one's a drop. Second one you can poke through. The first one's a mandatory little niblet. 
yeah, sometimes you'll go to roll over and what you think you might be 30, 40 feet from your entrance is like two or 300 feet in Alaska because everything's so much bigger up there. You're like, hey, I'm gonna do that cliff 30 footer and you get next to it, it's like 60 or 70. Like everything's way bigger than it looks up there for some reason. So it's really easy to get lost on top of the ridge and not know where your entrance is and that can be a little confusing until you get over and, and you say, you know, into that fluid motion when you're involved in the line. But the entrance and the top 100 feet or 200 feet is just blinding and you know, keep rolling and rolling and rolling, especially if you're riding 55 degrees plus. So it's, it's pretty burly and that's the scariest thing is being on top out of your board, you know, before you ride down, you know, you don't have that edge. But once I get on my board, I feel comfortable. I have my edge to dig in and uh, just wait for the cameras to say roll and then get it. It's pretty fun, actually. My first trip up to Alaska was with Noah and I'm I look back at that as like I'm so thankful I had someone as knowledgeable and as professional and as on it as he was to show me an introduction to you know one of the the biggest arenas of snowboarding you know especially with Mike and Dave Hatchett you know they are the ultimate mountaineering guides that can not only drop into the craziest terrain but allow you, you know, if something went down, be there for you and be able to assist in any kind of, you know, situation that could come up. It was a, it's a tense situation being up there. A lot of first descents, a lot of unstable snow conditions, and the knowledge and understanding of the mountains that Noah in particular showcased made me sit a little bit easier and dropping into a 55 degree slope where you couldn't even see what you were dropping into only by looking at the Polaroid picture that you took from the helicopter on the way up. You know, we shared a couple first ascents up in AKA that runs of a lifetime, you know, that I'll never forget. I was in uh, Alaska with Jamie one year. We had a really good trip and did some incredible lines together too. One of my first ascents, Blind Faith. I was with Jamie Lynn and that was one of my more notable runs and he was pretty stoked and terrified at the same time as was I but uh, we got out on this thing and the guide didn't get out. The guide got in the heli and flew. We couldn't believe it. We're like, isn't the guide supposed to get out with us? And we're like on this thing together, like on a cornice of all thing, entrance line. But anyway, it was, it was a pretty sick run and uh, he was in there, there for that. It was cool. I enjoyed riding powder. I never thought that that would have been most of my focus in my career later on, which it absolutely was. And not that I had tried to do that, I just kind of developed that way. And I had opportunity to go to Alaska, and that was amazing. And so I went back every year, and, and it's, it's super enjoyable as a rider. You know, it's the best thing to film because they're like, go ahead, ride the mountain. We'll film you from the heli. So you get this ride the whole thing, and you know, the footage that comes out of there isn't going to be freestyle based. It's going to be some powder. But uh, yeah, professionally, I think freestyle is where it's at. It's always been the progression that should be the focus, and it is of most sports, and it is in snowboarding. So I think that, you know, I don't know if it was a career mistake of mine, but uh, I don't think it certainly helped to, to focus strictly on powder as much as I did in big mountain riding. I should have done a little bit more of both, and, you know, and, or stayed in freestyle for longer. And, you know, I think I would have, you know, had a longer career had I done that potentially. So it's interesting to say, you know, this big mountain riding is pretty gnarly, putting your knife, life on the line for first descents. But a lot of people don't ride that kind of stuff and can't relate. They can relate to the parks and the pipes, and that's the stuff they want to see. And I understand that. And so it's unfortunately not as marketable, and, you know, that's how it is. I mean, I didn't really see it like that. I just kind of figured he just got sick of doing it. Because back then it seemed like the average, like, time span for, like, a top pro was, like, like if you had like five video parts, you're, you had a lot of video parts under your belt, you know what I mean? So he'd already had like a bunch of parts and I just figured he was on to other things or something, you know? You know, I never aspire to say or, or set goals for myself like most people probably do and should, I believe. But uh, I really was just motivated and hungry to ride and to film and wanted to put out these videos every year and they were selling well. and. You know, the boards were selling well, and I was just really motivated to, uh, to snowboard. I like snowboarding. But I would focus on a, a part every year and, and try to make a good part. And, 
you know, be aware of what I've shot so far this season and try to mix it up and, uh, you know, and then cap it with Alaska at the end of the year was always nice. But definitely made, you know, filming a priority and uh, try to put out the best part I could every year. And it's always hard. And everyone wants it to one up, you know, every year or put out a better part every year, and that can be tough. And unfortunately, as I became more popular, I could say, and worldwide, the travel becomes a little bit of an issue. I'm not great with travel, and a lot of times, you know, there's not, it's not all glory in snowboard. I'd go to Japan without my board and do five or six shop tours in a week, you know, and it's just sometimes it can be a burden, you know, and I wasn't cut out for that. I mean, you know, a lot of that people are like, I want to be sponsored, I'm going to be pro, I'm good enough. Well, you know, how professional are you, you know, can you, you know, it's a lot of marketing involved and you got to, you know, present yourself properly and, and do a lot of stuff you may not want to do. That became old, I think, year after year. And I just wanted to snowboard because that's who I was, a snowboarder. I wanted to ride powder and go to Alaska and I was able to do that. But you just want to snowboard and you're like, I rip, I'm in a video, I deserve this. And, you know, you think you're everything. And uh, sure, it's a lot of it, but uh, yeah, there's a lot more that comes with it that you don't realize when you're young, so is the start of the beginning of the end. <laughs> Hello. Hello. It's been a long day. A long month. A long couple of years, to be honest. <laughs> Just a year. How long? Fourteen. <laughs> Just kidding. This thing's not on, right? That thing's sick. Yeah, my last few years with Sims, um, my contract was up, and I had wanted to to break away from Sims and start this company with Mac Dog and Peter Lyon called Forum. And uh, I was into it, and I went to Sims and said, I don't want to resign, you know. And they, they said, hey, we have an obligation. For, we got you for two more years. If we want you, line 36C clearly states. I, I didn't fight them on it. I, I signed up again and, and balked on the forum thing, unfortunately. And uh, two years later, I, I don't know, they changed hands again. Sims had a lot of different CEOs, a lot of different manufacturers over the years. and. Uh, Unfortunately, it, uh, they didn't resign me after two years. They kind of left me hanging. I was like, whoa, you know, I wanted to break away and do my thing. Now you're, you're leaving me hanging. And it was a little late for me to get in on forum at that point, obviously. So uh, that was really unfortunate how that played out. And I really felt let down. And uh, man, I'd done so much for them over the years and kicked me to the curb in late summer without a contract and no warning. It's just kind of crazy by some 17 year old team manager. Doesn't seem right. So I was always a little jaded on that. I would have appreciated a call from anybody in the office, maybe even Tom, would have been cool. They, dude, we're not gonna make a board, sorry. But no, they had some kid come out and tell me they're not gonna re-sign me. After I begged him to not ride for him from, to go to this other company. So they really, I think, took advantage a little bit. And, and you know, unfortunately for me, it, you know, it didn't pan out that well afterwards for me. So uh, I would have loved to have been a part of Forum. I think probably he was being talked to just because he was such good friends with Mac Dog. And, uh, I think I do remember him talking about that actually, but like I said, like around that time, because I think Forum started like 96 or 7 as well, so he was, that was kind of that same time frame where he was kind of just trying to fade, or starting to fade out of the, the scene a little bit, you know? Now looking back on it, I don't know that I would have been a perfect piece of that puzzle because they were so freestyle oriented and handrails and just kickers and, and I don't know that they knew that then either they just had this idea and they wanted me in it was a good crew so far I wanted in. Back then when it started there wasn't that many people so I mean he was one of the best freestyler jibber dudes you know he wasn't like doing like crazy rails and stuff like that but he was definitely like bonking and and had like that skate style and then I know he was friends with Peter Lyon and stuff, and then there was only like me, Bjorn, and Chris Duffesy from there. So it was like him and Peter could have easily like spearheaded that whole thing together, and who knows which direction it would have went, you know? I would have been stoked. <laughs> In Sims, when I was growing up snowboarding, it was like Sims was the board. Everyone wrote them, wrote Sims. They were the best boards probably back then. It was just, it was incredible you know, to, to think that I would ride for them one day, and when I did, I think that it was such a large entity in my mind, you know, the Sims name is just a huge name in snowboarding, and uh, 
I was stoked to ride for him, and you know, I'm still am to, to say that I rode for him, but it just didn't go well at the end. And uh, everything works out for a reason. I feel like in life, and I can't complain. You know, should haves and would haves will kill you. I can sit here all day and say that, but uh, again, I have no regrets, and uh, you know, I've had a good, good experiences and great life in snowboarding for sure. I don't think that opportunity is gone for someone like Noah. You know, I, I really still feel that there's a lot of people out there that he's touched in a, in a way that has made a difference in their life. I guess what I've done for Billabong and Sims, you know, Billabong, I, I rode for them being the only rider for four or five years. I felt I helped develop a whole brand there. And with Sims, I felt that I brought them around with Palmer, brought them kind of back. And uh, yeah, I don't know. So a lot of it's my first ascents and the actual riding that I've done that I'm really stoked and proud of. Not necessarily in my accomplishments and my professional part, but, but the riding itself and the lines that I've done and super spines and all these just hairball things. And I risked my life, you know, and I'll never forget them. Like I could, it was like yesterday I remember these things and sick because I have that, you know, and I'll always have that. And that's pretty sweet. And that's the best thing I'll take with me for my snowboarding is all these experiences and what I've got to do over the years. And, and it's a blessing that companies like Billabong and DC and Dragon and people that have promoted me over the years, I really appreciate them too. Because I couldn't have done it without them. Okay, I'm ready for 10 seconds. You can count me in. No, it's kind of sticky, pal, in the fucking sunlit. That cliff was beat. That cliff was just beat. It was just peppery takeoff, huge. That snow got jacked. It's good in the shoot, though.